Okay, so our second speaker is the Institute's own uh, Yelika Sumich uh, Rea, uh, delivering a paper called Psychoanalysis in the Times of the Ineluctable Modality of the Visible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, Lorenzo Chiesa and Tadej Troja, for organizing this uh, conference, and especially for organizing the workshop for younger researchers who had an opportunity to present their work. And unfortunately, I was not there yesterday, but I hope that their papers will be available later so we can appreciate them. Um, and today, um, Without uh, uh, seeing an immediate link with the paper that was presented uh, so brilliantly by Adrian, there are nevertheless some points of compatibility and convergence, and we'll probably have the opportunity to discuss it later. So I would like to begin uh, with a few comments regarding the title of my paper, which is intended, of course, to bring together philosophy and psychoanalysis. I will, say to, uh, I, will, I will say more about it in a while, but for now, I will just extract, extract the signifier disorientation that I use to specify the real we contemporary subjects are confronted with in the 21st century. This signifier disorientation also acts as a quilting point for one of Badiou's recent seminars whose title is precisely Comment vivre et penser en un temps d'absolue désorientation, how to live and think in a time of the absolute disorientation. But you elaborate on it in order to examine mutations in subjective organization on a mass scale, and which are, according to him, due to the collapse of the emancipatory politics today. In this seminar, Badiou describes the major predicament of our time in terms of what he calls the implacable disorientation of humanity. This disorientation, according to Badiou, is due primarily, and I quote, to disappearance of any politics that strives to break with the laws of the market that reduce existence to the dialectic of work and the commodity, end of quote. But if capitalism, even in its current disastrous variety, is far from collapsing, we should ask ourselves, but you insist, what are we being asked to be for the sake of the planetary commercial order so that we are willing to tolerate it without making too much of a fuss, end of quote. Capitalism has little to fear, claims Badiou, so long as it can rely on the individualistic obsession with being myself, which allows us to imagine that we are free individuals. On the contrary, it is precisely this narcissistic cult that stands in the way of any attempt to think and practice that which is and must be common to all. Thus, in order to be able to come to grips with the current subjective disorientation, the first step towards a new orientation in thought and existence, as Badiou outlines this, is to break with the tyranny of liberal individualism, the cult of the individual as the major prescription of the capitalist order. Before turning to the implication of this diagnosis of the current impasse for contemporary thought and politics, as well as a possible way out of this predicament, we must examine what, if anything at all, psychoanalysis can offer in terms of a possible way out, insofar as psychoanalysis, like politics, confronts the problem of subjects' disorientation. It is therefore necessary to see what psychoanalysis means by this notion. Psychoanalysis tackles the problem of the current disorientation, starting from the always traumatic encounter between the signifier and the body, which orients psychoanalysis towards the singular, the like no other, in short, the incomparable. The emphasis on the incomparable imposes on psychoanalysis the treatment of the singular as an experience of the absence of all criteria, of all guarantees. So in targeting the singular, psychoanalysis seems to be in tune with the democratic individualism that contemporary civilization imposes upon us today. But psychoanalysis asks, does the focus on the singular 
incomparable inevitably lead to relativism. At first sight, it seems that Badiou raises a similar question. The dominant ideology of our time that he calls democratic materialism is based on the assumption that in our world there are only bodies and languages. This is, of course, from his logic of words. As the globalization of relativism, the epoch of democratic materialism can be described as the epoch of the triumph of narcissism. For psychoanalysis, too, the triumph of narcissism is the emblematic pathology of our time. This is because, for psychoanalysis, this contemporary narcissism coincides with the rise in the power of images. Our world is a world swarming, swarming with images. Indeed, we are living in an empire of images. The world we are living in today is a world that itself has been transformed into an image, or rather into a single yet unlimited image. This is a quote from Gerard uh, Vajman's Wall of Screens. For Lacanian psychoanalysis, an image inevitably refers to the gaze of the big other. The omnipresence of images signals the emergence of a new figure of the gaze, the gaze that sees all at once, breaking thereby with the structuring role of the frame, which could be summarized as framing is seen. From this perspective, our world is global, not only because it is the reign of the single market, but also because it is an, under the dominance of the gaze that has become one, as it knows no perspective and therefore no limit or obstacle. What characterizes the new regime of the gaze is precisely the absence of such a frame that would constitute a window looking out onto the world. With the elimination of the frame, the limits separating the subject from the scene of the world in which he or she could appear disappears too. Thus, in a world without places, the place of the subject is also erased. What psychoanalysis has to account for today is precisely the placeless subject in a placeless world. The grip that the image has on us is a clear sign of a modification in dialectic that determines the relationship between the agency of the imaginary, this being, of course, the ego, and the agencies of the symbolic, the subject of the unconscious and the big other. For the rise of the image is accompanied by the rise of the ego and the corresponding declines of the subject and the other. It is hardly surprising that in the era of the empire of images, an era of the ineluctable modality of the visible, to borrow Joyce's formulation from his Ulysses, psychoanalysis seems to be strangely out of sync with the zeitgeist. This is hardly surprising insofar as in psychoanalysis, in which the symbolic prevails over the imaginary, the ineluctable modality is the modality of the sayable rather than that of the visible. But the current powerlessness of psychoanalysis also results from the weakness of words themselves. Due to the inconsistency of the big other, words are increasingly becoming ineffective for responding to the deregulation of the speaking bodies. According to Lacan, psycho psychoanalysis is not possible if its other side, the reverse side, the master discourse, is inoperative, as it is precisely that discourse which allows the speaking being to attain his or her symbolic existence by being represented by the master signifier. Once the master's discourse is replaced by the capitalist discourse, the subject is no longer represented by the master signifier, which has marked the subject with an irreducible singularity. Rather, in the capitalist discourse, the subject is pinned down by a swarm of signifiers that, because they are countable, indifferent, and therefore replaceable, erase the subject's singularity. The inconsistent other that signals a major shift in the organization of our world from the universalist paradigm according to which the world is organized by the master signifier, marking a constitutive exception that assures the unity and totality of the world, to the paradigm of globalization and non-totalizability, 
a paradigm according to which the world is organized by a swarm of master signifiers whose very multiplicity prevents the world from constituting a whole, a unity. Worse, it renders it illegible. This is why Lacan could state in his seminar 21, Le non dupe air, the non dupe wonder or air, that for psychoanalysis, I quote, it is not a question of provoking disorder in the world. It is about reading the not all that is there, about rendering it legible, in fact. A swarm without an outside is a much better image of our globalized world, which was made possible through a peculiar alliance between the discourse of science and capitalism. This alliance has produced a new figure of the master, one that is seeking to impose a subjective rectification on a mass scale. The image of our globalized world is that of a world that is both open to all, uninclusive, so to speak, and hostile to exceptions. Evidence of this ambiguity that characterized the present conjecture can be seen in the injunction of today's superego forcing the subject to find his or her position in social bond by passively accepting a place that is already provided for him or her. In the globalized world of mass narcissism and the quantification of being, the dominant social bond is the negation of all bonds as it manifests itself in an untotalizable open series of homogeneous identical ones. As is well known for Lacan, the role of psychoanalysis is that of guiding the subject through the evolution of the semblance of civilization. And to the extent that the mutation of the big other of civilization necessarily leads to a modification of the form and usages of jouissance, we are faced today with the curious powerlessness of psychoanalysis in guiding the subjectivity of our time once the subject is enslaved by the power of the image. If the main goal of psychoanalysis today is to undo this irrepressible power of the image, it has to take into account a certain correlation between the installation of the empire of the image and what Lacan called the race to the zenith of the object A. The object A, the object surplus jouissance that is situated beyond the relation of the big other, Within the new paradigm, the paradigm of the object surplus uh, jouissance, the object A becomes something that can be calculated, evaluated. This also explains why mass-produced mass objects, a variety of gadgets that have become indispensable in our life, could become a model for the object surplus jouissance. For the object, surplus jouissance is governed by the logic of the capitalist market, which means that it is considered from the point of, of its value on the market of jouissance. As such, the object surplus jouissance can only bring about an autistic, a sexual jouissance that no longer involves the other. The consequence of this is that the satisfaction of the drive gives rise only to the demand of more, for more, for encore, to borrow Lacan's proper term, for again, to be taken in the sense of more and always more outside any relation to the other. With the mass production of the object surplus jouissance, the subject's lack of being seems to be inoperative today. The lack of being only appears as a being in excess with respect to what is wanted. Thus, the subject himself or herself turns into an object, I, object A of a very special kind, waste to be eliminated. The current fascination for the image cuts the link between words and bodies. In so doing, the frenetic quest for jouissance renders contemporary subjectivity particularly unresponsive to the analytic treatment whose main tool remains speech. Paradoxically, what brings words and bodies together, despite their current disjunction in the culture of the image, is the generalized narcissism. Thus, what characterizes the dominant social experience today is the installation of the tyranny of the surplus jouissance governed by the logic of the market as testified by the variety of modalities of addictive behavior proliferating today, contemporary subject 
quote in the autistic repetitious jouissance of the one, exemplified by bulimia, anorexia, teximania, and so on, appear to be incapable of changing the mode of their enjoyment and thus of breaking with their deadly solitude. This tyranny of the surplus jouissance gives rise to the industry of narcissism, an industry driven by the paradoxes of the uniformizing tyranny of the narcissism of increasingly small differences, a mass reproduction of narcissized bodies that occupies the emptied place of the other. In contrast to the generalized narcissism, what brings bodies and words together for psychoanalysis is the symptom. Defined as a mark of the other on the body, the symptom manifests itself in the disturbance of the body, or more precisely, the emergence of an always contingently fixated mode of jouissance to which the subject will remain enslaved. It is true that psychoanalysis is today no longer the same as it was in Lacan's time, and still less in Freud's time. This is because the status of the big others has changed since we are speaking of its inexistence. But the necessity of solving the problem of regulating of bodies and words by means of the symptom results today, as in the past, from an impasse, indeed, from what could best be termed the unresponsiveness of the subject of the unconscious to the psychoanalytic treatment. For psychoanalysis to account for this strange unresponsiveness of the subject of the unconscious to the analytic treatment means to take into account the effect that the analytic discourse itself has on the discourse of the unconscious. Paradoxically, it is because of the impact of the analytic discourse on the discourse of the unconscious that the analytic treatment no longer has the same effects as it did before. According to Lacan, the issue of the ego is put on the agenda of, agenda of psychoanalysis whenever analysants appear to be immune to the cure, which is to say, whenever the effects of speech in analysis wear off. Taking up the Freudian notion of the ego, designed as an organ outside of the body, yet invested with libido, Lacan concludes that the speaking being remains enslaved to the narcissized, libidinized image, precisely to the extent that the longed-for unity of the ego, ego comes from the image of the body. The preeminence of the image of the one's own body today is reaffirmed in a culture of narcissism. But to what extent does contemporary narcissism succeed in regulating the gaze if to attain jouissance by the ceaseless projection of the self-image necessarily involves the supposition of the gaze of the big other. Indeed, the dependence of the image returned from the big other is one of the essential traits of the ego of our time. Paradoxically, it is the exaltation of the image of the ego, a kind of imaginary bulimia that prevents the subject from separating himself herself from the gaze of the other. In his or her attempt to satisfy the demands of an ideal other that the social imaginary imposes upon us, the contemporary subject is forced to succeed and enjoy in order to satisfy the greediness of the economic machine, which in order to be efficient, instrumentalizes the gaze of the big other. The price to be paid for the ego's unstoppable quest for jouissance is therefore a desperate quest for the approval to be found in the other's gaze, which indicates the inability of the contemporary subject to control the excess of surplus jouissance. For psychoanalysis, the social reinforcement of this attachment of the subject to his or her image is possible exact, exactly to the extent that the symbolic order is inoperative. This is precisely why contemporary narcissism could be considered as both as a problem, but also as a solution, as a symptomatic solution, to be precise. This is to say, as a solution that each subject has to find out for him or herself in order to counteract the failure of the symbolic big other to regulate jouissance. Now, the ego in contemporary narcissism is not to be confused with the ego of the mirror state. As the case of Joyce shows, the function of the ego radically changes. 
from being a veil of castration to a supplement to the paternal lack, to the deficiency of the name of the father, that agency precisely whose principal function is to regulate jouissance. The change in the way in which the image of the ego is made operational in current culture of narcissism requires a close examination of the status of that object I, that is structurally correlated to the image, namely the gaze. The gaze can be considered as a perfect model for the object A, since being a whole, the gaze itself is precisely what cannot be captured in the mirror. By being extracted from the picture, the gaze constitutes the invisible frame, or rather, to use Lacan's own term, the window onto the real, in order for something in the scopic field, the perceptual reality becomes visible. The end of analysis would then mark a moment of seeing the window as such a frame. In the new regime of regime, it is, uh, sorry, in the new regime of the gaze, it is precisely the extraction of the gaze as the window onto the real that has become problematic. As a result, the subject is left defenseless against the invasion of the surplus jouissance. It then follows that the contemporary subject, the only way for him or her to regulate the invading jouissance is to resurrect the gaze of the big other. So what is at stake in psychoanalysis today is to find the particular way to exit from the trap of art narcissism and thus to break with the deadly solitude by establishing an impossible link with the other, which remains a fiction. The main difficulty today consists therefore in making possible the resurrection of the figure of the inexistent other that would then allow the subject to wrench himself or herself from the repetitious autoerotic jouissance of the one, and in so doing, allow for the emergence or rather creation of something new. Thus for psychoanalysis, taking into account of the profound transformation of the function of the ego today, inevitably raises the question of that leverage which makes psychoanalysis possible, that is to say, the question of transference. What is needed today is a re-examination of the work on transference in analysis in the context of the current culture of narcissism and the effects obtained through its handling that will enable the modification of jouissance of the subject. Since the mutation of the other civilization leads to a modification of the modality and usages of jouissance, psychoanalysis has to take into account the profound change in the matrix of civilization summarized in Lacan's famous formula, there is no other of the other. If believing is to believe in the big other, then the loss of belief primarily concerns the semblant, those phenomena that depend on belief, but whose function is precisely to be a defense against the disruptive real. But contemporary subjects are surprisingly defenseless before the eruption of the real, precisely to the extent that they cannot believe in the big other. The contemporary subject, enlightened by deconstruction and cultural relativism, already knows that there is no such a thing as objective reality, that reality is a symbolic construction. The current climate of incredulity and the total loss of trust can therefore be explained by another essential feature of the, our times, that of generalized semblantification. But for psychoanalysis, the crisis of belief that affects the semblance is even more devastating. It is disastrous because it raises the question how to operate in times of incredulity and lack of belief in the, the big other with the means proper to psychoanalysis, that is to say, with semblance. In its attempt to provide a solution, psychoanalysis has set out from the fact that in world of speaking beings marked by an always contingent encounter between words and bodies, it is disorder, a lawless real that rules rather than harmony. It should be noted that the disorder that psychoanalysis has to deal with today, as has already been pointed out by Badiou, is political. It results from the disruption of the symbolic order caused by the combined domination of two discourses, the discourse of science and capitalism, that has brought about the destruction of the traditional structure of human experience. Setting out from jouissance and the impossible reduction of this quantum civilization linked to this jouissance, 
The analytic discourse rejects the current subjective rectification on a mass scale imposed by a new master. Indeed, psychoanalysis acquires its, bio, sorry, acquires its power precisely from being demassifying. The solution provided by psychoanalysis today is a paradoxical solution. It consists in replacing the disorder caused by the, disorder, by the discourse of science and the capitalist discourse with another disorder, a subversive one, a disorder that undoes the subject's defense against the lawless real. To put it differently, if the speaking being is the name of the Lacanian subject who is affected by language, more precisely affected by the contingent encounter between words and bodies, it constitutes our lawless real, then the goal of psychoanalysis is to reach what in each subject constitutes his or her singularity, his or her absolute difference. So what is it that psychoanalysis proposes by way of a solution? Put simply, it consists in waging on the real that psychoanalysis extracts from its experience. The real that psychoanalysis deals with is not only that of science and modification that it produces, that is to say, the chaotic produ production of world governed by gadgets. The real that comes from the experience of psychoanalysis is rather the real that sets itself against globalization. Since it, since it is a real which escapes the grip of the modern discourse of the master, that of capitalism. As unbearable as it may be for the speaking being, the real of the analyst discourse is a real which allows the subject to assume their absolute difference, their incomparability, and assume the mark that makes us what we are and with which we may each refuse, to quote again Badiou, what we are asked to be for the sake of planetary commercial order. For Freud, as is well known, the unheard novelty of psychoanalysis is not simply the discovery of the unconscious, but also its refusal to satisfy the analyzant demand to make him or her happy again by getting rid of the symptom, the cause of the, the, cause of the analyzant's suffering. Dismissing the idea that analytic discourse offers any promise of happiness, psychoanalysis nevertheless offers something precious in turn. It seeks to provoke the analyzant's desire to know and to recognize in his or her symptom the mark of his or her singularity. Yet for the analyzant to be able to read his or her unconscious desire, to paraphrase the title of John Kopje's book, that will enable him or her to wrench himself, herself, from the alienating identification and break with the autistic repetitious jouissance that condemns the subject to his solitude, another function is called for, an identification of a different kind, as Lacan says in Seminar 11, identification with a symptom. The question then becomes how to bring the subject to the point of recognizing the symptom he or she complains about the very knot that holds him or her together, the imaginary unity attained to the image of the body, a symbolic existence as it is through the signifier that the subject finds a place in the field of the other, and the real of his or her always unique singular mode of jouissance, or rather, how to lead the subject to the point of being able to give a name to the real that designates the singularity of his or her subjective position. In short, to discover in the, something, in the symptom his or her true, that is to say, symptomal name. Refusing to promise the analyst and the recovery of his or, her happen, his or her happiness by helping reconcile him or her to civilization, Psychoanalysis promises the analyzant something entirely different, the uncovering of the revolutionary potential of his or her very symptom. To uncover this revolutionary potential, it is essential to focus on the position of the analyst in, the transfer, in transference. That's why transference love bears upon the knowledge that the analyst is supposed to hold beyond this supposed knowledge the analyst is also a corporate presence, a body, or rather an object, whose main function is to provide, through its mute presence, a corporal support that enables the installation of the analyzant's true partner, namely his or her symptom. 
From the point of view of psychoanalysis, the symptom in its revolutionary capacity opens up for the analysand the possibility of escaping from the formatting imposed upon him or her by the dominant discourse, and in so doing, of enabling him or her to think otherwise and produce new knowledge for innovative action. Today, however, this path of knowledge seems to be unworkable, impossible even. Once knowledge is devaluated, it is no longer an object of love, says Lacan in his seminar, De Notre à l'autre, but has become merchandise itself. With the disjunction between knowledge and the big other, its guarantor, there inevitably arises the question of what kind of relation does the contemporary subject have with knowledge and jouissance? With the emergence of a new paradigm of surplus jouissance, when knowledge itself is evaluated from the point of view of its jouissance value, it has lost its agalmatic value, says Milner in his book, Le Juif de Savoir, The Jew of Knowledge. Knowledge has become something quite indifferent. So for Lacan, there is a connection between the race to the zenith of the object A and the devaluation of knowledge. The paradigm of knowledge that dominates today is a knowledge cut from both the object and the subject, a knowledge reduced to an algorithmic technology, just like the drive circling blindly around the hole and therefore indifferent to the object that enables it to remain in circulation, algorithmic knowledge is an acephalic machine for the calculation and evaluation of everything, which means anything. With the current de of knowledge, there seems to be no room for the subject supposed to know. Contemporary subjectivity, being indifferent to knowledge, knows only of the various experiences of the object, its addictive and inexorable mode of jouissance, which from the start prevents the onset of transference. Without the possibility of clarifying what his or her status is, is as an object of the drive, the subject nowadays is condemned to the unsayable, repetitive, and uh, unchangeable jouissance. From the perspective of the prevailing indifference to knowledge that renders, renders transference difficult, if not impossible, psychoanalysis too seems to be in danger of extinction. So for there to be psychoanalysis, it is crucial to re-examine the current possibility of transference in psychoanalysis. In the era of the tyranny of jouissance, as manifest in the current triumph of narcissism and indifference to knowledge, transference appears less to be a matter of supposed knowledge, articulated, bonded with love, than a matter of knowing how to deal with the real of jouissance. Upon confronting that dimension of speaking beyond that can only be designated as a mute corporeal presence, the sight of jouissance in the subject supposed to know becomes inoperative, ineffective, precisely because knowledge itself comes up against an unsurpassable limit. The emphasis shifts from the effect of the signifier to presence and substance as jouissance can only be experienced in the living body. In bringing together knowledge and jouissance, the focus in handling of transference now moves towards the corporeal presence as a stand-in for what is unsayable, that dimension of the speaking being that belongs to the body as real. The unsayable presence in the, of, in the speaking being, because it is unrepresentable by the signifier, can therefore, be can therefore be presentified by one of the four instances of the object A, the gaze, the voice, the breast, or the faces. We are dealing here with the presentification of the speaking being via the materiality of the object, instead of the representation of the subject of the unconscious via the signifier. In the new mod modality of handling transference, the goal is therefore to isolate what is unsayable for the subject that can therefore take on the status of the object. This unsayable dimension of the speaking being can only be presentified by the analyst's mute presence, 
what the analyst lends his or her body to is precisely this dimension of jouissance as a mute staging of the drive, a dimension that remains irreducible to the signifier. The necessity of situating the analyst as a mute presence sheds light on the shift that has been taking place in the Henley on transference. From the relation between knowledge and love, constitutive of the Freudian transference, to the relation between knowledge and jouissance that designates the novelty of Lacanian elaboration of transference. And now to conclude, the analytic discourse, to repeat one more, once more, does not lend itself to any form of mass subjective rectification because it draws its power precisely from what is demassifying, namely jouissance. This is why psychoanalysis accompanies the subject in his or her protest against the discontent of civilization, in his or her solitude, in his or her own exile. But this path is not without risks. Instead of interpreting the subject based on his saying, his or her sayings, slips of the tongue, contradictions, psychoanalysis today grounds its interpretation on what the body says, that is to say, on jouissance that affects it. It is as if psychoanalysis sets out from the assumption that it is the body that tells the truth rather than the subject whose speech always lies. This distinction allows for further distinction between the effects of the signifier on the, on the speaking body. There are, on the one hand, the traces of the signifier that affect the subject and that have produced the effects of meaning, and on the other hand, the traces inscribed on the body that have produced jouissance effects. Consider the following remark by Lagan from his seminar 23, Le Santon. The drives are the echo in the body of the fact that something is said, end of quote. It is in the light of this partition that Lacan can separate the term, the symptom, which is best suited for the signifier insofar as it aims at meaning, and the term, santon, which incarnates the invisible yet ineffaceable mark that is the remainder of the impact of the signifier on the body of the drive. Disconnected from the unconscious, which calls for interpretation and meaning, and separated from the big other, the santon is an invention of the speaking being that provides him or her with singularity, incomparability, at the level of the jouissance of the speaking being. In dealing with the autistic jouissance that necessarily excludes the social bond, psychoanalysis appears to provide the speaking being an apology for irresponsibility. In a society that is organized around the real produced through the alliance of capitalism and science, only day-to-day -day counts, hedonism, where jouissance for all would immediately reduce jouissance of the one. Paradoxically, psychoanalysis, in taking seriously its mission, that is to say, to guide the contemporary subject in this world, would not provide a solution, a way out, by manufacturing made-to-measure santon according to its singularity. This is not a solution precisely to the, the extent that it would reduce the santon to a semblant. One of the challenges to psychoanalysis in the era of the inexistent other and the lawless real is rather the question of knowing how only the contingent can become the limit of the frenetic quest for jouissance offered in the current scientific or capitalistic conjecture. And, this, and it is up to the speaking being, the palette, to counter it, bypass it, quash it, or on the contrary, to make use of the senton, which despite the fact that it leads to the solitude of the speaking being, can also provide a solution that allows the speaking being to deal more or less efficiently with social relate, relations with others. Thank you. Thank you, Yuritsa. It was a, a great lecture. Um, I have a, one very quick, uh, very short general uh, question. 
uh, at the beginning you were saying you were talking about the disorientation related to Badiou. Uh, how would you comment on this um, on the political level, right? Uh, you have like a, like a general disorientation. Then in the in the times of crisis, you know, various crises, as right now, the the um, since this uh, October the seventh, right? Um, then you, you got this some sort of excessive orientation. Uh, you know, like kind of impose. So, what would be the so, uh, let's say, our position, right, or, or the the position that you're trying to as a, promote as a as a solution or, or a way to uh, to find a way out, has like a double enemy in in this in this way, like a general disorientation, but also these you know, crises that are going on that you also have to, you actually have to deal all the time with excessive orientation, which is a, some sort of dictated stupidity, I would say, you know, everything the, the, that that even the, the propaganda knows by now that, that the images that they produce are, are of this sort that they are not actually meant to be believed in, uh, that, that, it, that they are in, in a way real, but they kind of openly fake uh, so that that the way to identify with this, with their position, would be to identify with something that is openly fake and say yes, this is open, this is this is fake, but it is in in, a, in some on a, some general abstract way it is true. For instance, there was a there was like a video now um, it's been taken off uh, of Twitter, right, or, or the X. Of um, it was discovered that uh, the, what the, it was a video of a, of a supposedly um, a nurse in a, in a hospital in Gaza, right? Uh, it turned out that she was actually an Israeli actor mm. and a content uh, creator. But this, uh, you know, this, this is like a 50-second uh, clip, right? It was so obviously fake. I mean, uh, dressed in a in the in a wearing the whitest mask possible, you know, the the prettiest glasses, uh, with a with a um, Israeli accent even when she spoke Arab Arabic and stuff. So, but um, what they what they I think that what they're counting on. I mean, the, this sort of propaganda. What counts on again is a uh, is like really to to join join us in this, you know. Um, in this year, like stupid uh, engagement with the, with the images that we are actually that we, we would actually be to, if uh, accepting this, I don't know, um, the end of trying to be smart or how do, how would I put it? Uh, thank you today for this rather complex question, series of questions. So first of all. First of all, the distinction or the paradox of uh, disorientation, general disorientation and an excessive orientation. I think um, the basis, of course, is this generalized disorientation, which in a sense is unbearable. It is, I think there are some, uh, it is not uh, sort of my, um, or, uh, my interpretation, but uh, I was, uh, paying attention to the fact that a lot of uh, people are drawing some parallels between our situation and uh, um, a, a situation before the Second World War uh, with the crumbling of the symbolic order of their time and uh, um, a sort of unconscious, uh, unconscious desire to prefer any kind of order or orientation in this kind in this sense, then disorientation, no orientation whatsoever. So this excessive orientation, I think, is a, a way for contemporary su subject, for contemporary subjectivity to avoid the, this really impossible situation of having no clues, no uh, points of reference. So this would be my, I don't know if this, um, this uh, is an answer, not a full answer to your question, but this would be a sort of a, a, a quick uh, response to your question. The second uh, level of how is it possible that, that something which is obviously a fake uh, video can nevertheless, and knowing that a lot of people will know that it is a fake, is in, is still effective? I think again there is such a desire to get, you know, um, um, evidences for what you want to be proved that even though this is obviously a fake, nevertheless, it could be true. So the very fact that it could be true is satisfying. 
yeah, Lorenzo. <laughs> yeah. No, just, uh, sorry, just uh, just to. Uh, um, I think what the what the thing what is all, what, what this is all about is you know it's not actually to you know for them to believe you know for this collective to believe in this image, but uh, kind of some sort of enjoyment in um, in the impossibility of of, of defense against the, this pr production of images. So it kind of goes together with this uh, you know, again with this case with this really simplified. Um, signifier of anti-Semitism, right, which is kind of going on, and that that can actually work only because people who who use it as an argument have never seen like uh, even a documentary on on the Holocaust, have never watched like Lanzmann and and you know and films um, of of this sort, right? Have, have no clue, but it is kind of easy just to to believe in the you know like in this pure kind of abstract anti-Semitism that that has no kind of content, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think this is a, a, a the I mean the the, the the people that do the, this propaganda is actually a, yeah it's 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 kind of enjoying in 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 the in the other side. Being objectively unable to to defend themselves or to mm. to you know to um, kind of um, you know it's it's very difficult you know always when you have like this when uh, anti-Semitism or, or things like this come come to the you know to to, to the menu right of of discussion um, you can never really refute you know this um, mm. this um, 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 how do you say it? Uh, I don't know. I think we, you got the point. Right? Okay. I think we've got two mics now, so this changes everything. So we've got yeah, uh, Lorenzo. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great paper. And as you know, there's a lot of intersection also with my specific oh. <laughs> concerns. So let me just put it bluntly. In a sense, we are dealing, and you delineated that very clearly, with a twofold uh, impasse, a twofold deadlock. One is internal to psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. To put it even more bluntly, its effectiveness, psychoanalysis effectiveness, mm -hmm. is no longer what it used to be. Yeah, yeah. Hence, second aspect or layer of the impasse, psychoanalysis, to put it very bluntly, can no longer be a critical discourse mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. regard to the kind of capitalism you discuss. Yeah, yeah. Now, we are all, I guess, uh, all people present, trying to think a way out. Now, um, comment, but also question, especially going back to uh, your use of Badiou, my use of Badiou, uh, Alenka's use of Badiou, many people's mm -hmm. use of Badiou. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't we take, you know, the Alliance, Lacan, Badiou much, much more seriously, mm -hmm. even within the clinics mm -hmm. and the problem of effect effectiveness of psychoanalysis today? That is to say, shouldn't we think a new psychoanalysis in terms of a generic truth procedure, a fifth mm -hmm. condition in Badiouzian jargon, which is something which Badiou says back in the 90s with, mm -hmm. you know, like dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. But it, it's also my own way of reading the very, very late Lacan. Mm -hmm. I mean, this solution, the very last seminar or non-seminar, I think is saying something very similar to what Badiou would call uh, a potential uh, generic truth procedure. Mm -hmm. Or to put it in Lacanese, now, uh, one thing is the discourse of the analyst, mm, which is an intraclinical discourse. One thing is Lacan's opening towards a potential discourse of analysis. Mm -hmm. So to go back to some of the uh, terms you used, if the S1s, the masters, master signifiers of contemporary capitalism, its use of the image is a swarm. Mm -hmm. We cannot think that the answer to the swarm is a new kind of frame mm -hmm. or window. Mm -hmm. uh, we need a field to mm -hmm. be more Lacanese, mm -hmm. right? So how do you locate yourself in, in that context? Because I, I really follow you entirely and sympathize totally, mm -hmm. up to perhaps my problem would be to say that a possible way out both intrapsychoanalytical, let's make it work mm -hmm. again, and hence psychoanalysis as a resuscitated critical discourse again, capitalism, is a quite millering identification with the symptom. I, I think yeah, like mm -hmm. what Miller lacks is, well, Miller, let's say mainstream mm -hmm. Lacanian psychoanalysis, what in my opinion, with all due respect, they lack is precisely the opening up in terms mm -hmm. of the passage from the analyst discourse 
to the discourse of analysis as a field, mm -hmm. which is more or less a truth uh, to, yet to be invented, a uh, generic truth procedure. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's, uh, well, first of all, um, to uh, consider or try to evaluate uh, the impact uh, that your uh, uh, thesis that we should uh, start to think of the analytic discourse as a, a generic procedure is something I think which would have you know uh, really far far uh, fetched uh, implications for theory of psychoanalysis and possibly also of practice. Well, on the one hand, you are absolutely right because psychoanalysis, neither theory nor practice is, you know, uh, is not uh, taking place in a va vacuum. So in fact, it is the change in the political social field is something which necessarily impacts uh, uh, psychoanalytic theory and psychoanalysis. So in this sense, I would absolutely agree with you. We should think you know, isn't it uh, possible to use some of, uh, but use um, conceptions, especially of uh, the gener generic truth, as a new way to uh, rethink uh, psychoanalysis in our, uh, well, in, in a situation which is really a predicament for psychoanalysis itself, in order to open up some new possible paths that could save psychoanalysis. Because in, I think psychoanalysis, especially psychoanalysts who write, are aware of the fact that with the generalized uh, relativization, that as you have pointed out yourself, you know, we cannot uh, seek any more uh, as a way out for uh, the analysants, uh, the um, identification of master signifiers. It doesn't work, you know, so there are, there are, we have to look for something other. Uh, but uh, I think my, my attempt to answer your question would be, is it possible to think together, and this is something which uh, I think uh, Badiou would agree, but I, I'm not sure whether Lacan would agree, uh, the, the, the convergence or um, a relationship to rethink the relationship between the radical singularity and universality, and this is something which would open up, you know, the, this, uh, the possibility of the encounter between psychoanalysis and um, uh, um, for philosophy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is uh, my phone, but <laughs> no, just very quickly. But also, like, wouldn't it be a thinking what we've been discussing? Also, a way of opening up again and revitalizing the connection and distinction and connection between endlich and unendlich analysis. You know, mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm, in, mm -hmm. the, in the context yeah, yeah, of yeah. the clinic, why yeah. not? We can say that endlich yeah. analysis yeah. is identification with the symptom. Yeah, yeah, Something yeah. like that. Yeah. But that, that is no longer effective mm -hmm. if not continued, and there's also a dimension of retrospection, by a field of psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. a discourse of analysis, which is not just a discourse of mm -hmm. an analyst, mm -hmm. and that's where I think the you lacan connection becomes yeah, much yeah. more I well, agree. Poli politically psychoanalytical. Maybe just a, a quick uh, answer. You know, I did not uh, fully answer your question about the problems with the identification with the symptom. It's not about, for me, this is how I understand it. It's not about, ah, now I am this, you know, I am my symptom. It's rather like in an event in, for Badiou, it's the first step. It is from now on, new uh, pathways are open, you know, so this, yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's a sort of fixing, uh, uh, yeah, the real and, uh, but it is from then on, you have to do something, you know, new edges, yeah, yeah. Uh, Adrian? Well, thank you very much for an extremely rich talk, Yelitsa. Um, and while listening, I had 
a series of questions that arose that can be condensed into just a single question about um, your manner of you might say historically situating the mutations in mm -hmm. capitalism mm -hmm. and science mm -hmm. that have led to this sort of crisis, mm -hmm. including, you know, the uh, decreasing efficacy of analysis. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, as you well know, Lacan repeatedly insists that modern science, in its 17th century origins, serves as a historical con possibility condition mm -hmm. for Freud's work, the discovery of the unconscious, the invention of analytic mm -hmm. practice. Practice, et cetera, and that later, particularly post May 68, when Lacan in, 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 in places like the 16th and 17th seminars is prompted by events to re-engage with Marx and to mm -hmm. take his work seriously, you know, Lacan also signals his agreement with the periodization of this in terms of, all right, Marx essentially is right that it's more or less early 16th century where we have the origins of capitalism and then it gets up and running. And so you have have then this sense of the longer history from early modernity through today of mm -hmm. the twin relations between capitalism mm -hmm. and science, and both of these for mm -hmm. Lacan as backdrops to what eventually becomes the Freudian discovery. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it seems there that for Lacan, well, capitalism and science on the one hand are historical possibility conditions for psychoanalysis, yet, of course, I think as you rightly point out, they have now become, instead of, you know, conditions of possibility, mm -hmm. they've switched to becoming more conditions mm -hmm. of impossibility. Mm -hmm. So something along the way changed mm -hmm. in this arc from mm -hmm. early modernity through today. And you know, my question would be for you, where exactly where to specify this? Because there seem to be a number of candidates. You know, is it that we go as far back as, say, the 18th century Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. and what that brings with it as a mutation in capitalism that then leads to all of this? Or do we look more recently to things like let's say, the shift post-World War II to a more consumerist mm -hmm. model of capitalism mm -hmm. that many read Lacan as trying to capture with talking about his superego as distinct from Freud's, you know, in places like Seminar 20? Or do we have to, you know, get even more recent and talk about, say, you mentioned globalization, all right, the development of this new kind of neoliberal capitalism mm -hmm. starting in the 90s? And then finally, the last candidate that popped to my mind would be much more recent and would be when you talk about algorithms, mm -hmm. you know, they now what seems to be for the first time not false dawn mm -hmm. in terms of the emergence of artificial intelligence. And the latter, you know, this last one that's very recent seems like it's very important to your, your approach because when you talk about the, you know, rightly transference as crucial mm -hmm. for analysis to work, you know, it's as though what we're beginning to have now now is the possibility of, well, it seems that what we have is, so when you take Lacan's definition of transference as involving the subject supposed to know, mm -hmm. we have the knowing part, but now it's, you know, especially in the guise of things like algorithms, it's detached from any subjects. Mm -hmm. It seems as mm -hmm. though Lacan's phrase, we have to read it as indicating that transference requires not only transference onto knowledge, but also onto a subject that is taken to mm -hmm. be, an, you know, a representative mm -hmm. of that knowledge. And it seems as though what we're beginning to have now is the separation of knowledge from particular mm -hmm. representatives as something which might problematize transference. But I had difficulty for myself determining, all right, where along the way from the 16th and 17th mm -hmm. centuries to today, you see the shifts where capitalism and science go from enabling to inhibiting, mm -hmm. um, you know, psychoanalysis. Uh, again, a, a very difficult question, but uh, I'll try to, to respond very briefly. It's difficult to pinpoint exactly, you know, in the history of um, the conditions of possibilities for psychoanalysis in this um, alliance of science and capitalism to conditions of impossibility for psychoanalysis. I would say, for me, I mean, this is how I uh, try to um, understand it is the moment when uh, knowledge is devaluated. So knowledge and truth are devaluated and become, be, but well, Lacan is speaking about it, if not earlier than in uh, the seminar 16, um, where he's, uh, this is why I, why I also quoted uh, from this seminar, uh, knowledge is one of the commodities, you know. I think, you know, the moment that knowledge loses this emblematic value, this is the moment precisely where the problems start for psychoanalysis too. So how to, 
how not to, as I said, the solution is not even with, you know, this identification with a symptom, why the solution is not, you know, to, oh, well, you, you have to have a tailor-made, you know, symptom and you identify with it. This is also something which can be manipulated. There's no problem whatsoever, you know. The problem, I think, is um, rather to insist on the unbearable singularity of ones of the symptom without trying to give it a meaning or interpreting, but taking it up as a, a, a sort of a moment from which one starts to do something else, you know. Think otherwise, you know, try to find other pathways to, you know, if not for others, at least for oneself, you know, for instance, as an artist, one is creative, you know, this is the moment, you know, when uh, the identification with the symptom can open up uh, a path for the creation of something new, which is also for others, not only for this uh, particular speaking being. So I would say the moment of the devaluation of, uh, even with Lacan, you know, uh, it is after the proposition, for instance, that the, 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 the he starts to criticize the, the notion of knowledge, you know, and say, you know, this is also a semblant, you know. So, but what is it that, you know, replaces, you know, the knowledge in this status that it had for psychoanalysis, you know, how do you deal with the, the real and the unbearability of, and the bearable character of the jouissance? This is another matter, you know. How can this be useful, not only for, you know, individual, you know, analysants in an analysis, but also for, you know, how can it have an, a wider impact on, in a society and also, you know, for how, how would it be possible to, to build a bridge, you know, with, you know, this political philosophical aspect that, you know, uh, uh, Badiou is developing and psychoanalysis, you know, are they, could they be uh, allies, you know, in this uh, uh, new attempt of orientation in the times of disorientation? Thank you. Got time for one more question? Okay, how should we? Um, I've got a very quick question, uh, yeah. and I hope, it, I hope it's fair. Um, I say I hope it's fair just because it's, it's about something you haven't really mentioned yet. Um, but I, I was just wondering um, if anything, if, if it does play a role, but what role community um, might play this, or the idea of community in terms of this? political potential. I mean, you know, in the 20th century, you get various kind of attempts to think through community as a way of responding to mm -hmm. not only the problem of subjectivity, mm -hmm. but this atomized subjectivity mm -hmm. in the way you presented it and the kind of meaninglessness that, that comes mm -hmm. with that subjectivity. And, you know, community is expressed by Blanchot and, and Bataille yeah, as yeah, this kind yeah. of collective effervescence mm -hmm. of challenging that. Um, does psycho, psychoanalysis in uncovering the revolutionary potential, as you put it before, have something to say about community in that sense, or is there a role community plays in this? Or? Well, it has quite a lot to mm, say yeah, yeah. about it. First of all, mm -hmm. the first level is uh, to um, uh, demarcate, you know, psychoanalysis from the view how psychoanalysis is only about sing, uh, singularities, about individual analysants and it doesn't care about the, the social context? Mm. No, you know, because the, for Freud already and for Lacan, you know, the, the unconscious is uh, something where the, the individual cannot be separated from the collective, you know, so, but how can one transpose? Well, the collective or community or identities uh, have some suspicious uh, mm. flavor for psychoanalysis, obviously. But nevertheless, psychoanalysis, at least this is my reading of uh, Lacan, some of Lacan, is that uh, in establishing his school and opens uh, it up, not only for the analyst, uh, analysts, but also for non-analysts, you know, this is an attempt of thinking, well, his, uh, his assumption is, is that community as such is the real, which means impossible, you know. So how can we deal with this impossibility and nevertheless try to think the possibility of a social bond which uh, avoids the, uh, the traps of the 
social bonds uh, established by other kinds of yeah. discourses. This is, you yeah, know, the yeah. political question that uh, psychoanalysis is interested in. So, and this is linked to what psychoanalysis can transmit, and we can go back to the um, um, uh, Adrian's uh, mentioning of how uh, Lacan tries to cope with the issue of the matem as a means how to transmit something to others without losing, you know, the, what this is all about, you know. Are there ways in psychoanalysis where one can transmit something valuable in psychoanalysis to others, whether they have gone through analysis and whether they're analysts or not? So this is, the, I think, the, where the question of community intervenes in psychoanalysis. It's not sort of a ready-made answer, but a way of thinking about uh, community. Mm. In particular, because you know, for psychoanalysis, this is uh, the first step towards thinking about communi community is how to disidentify. You know, mm. so this and it's yeah. it's beyond identification. But how can you then? Uh, uh, how can a community be constituted if it is not based uh, based on uh, any kind of identification? Mm. So yeah. This is the time. That's great. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll, we'll stop there. So a round of applause, please for.